Hello, everyone. I'm Barry Steigers, KHI Morning News host, and also your host here on Auburn News Channel 20. Auburn and marijuana don't get along very well. There was some time ago an ordinance passed that said you can't have a marijuana medical dispensary in the city of Auburn. That ordinance got challenged. I ask Councilman Mike Holmes, who has been a part of that ordinance for some time, to give me an update because as of Monday, the Supreme Court said that the ordinance in every town in California could in fact have an ordinance that says there will not be marijuana within the city. Here's what Mike said. Mike, uh, the Supreme Court came down with a decision on Monday that the ordinance here in the city of Auburn, which would uh, limit or not allow the so-called marijuana, medical marijuana shops. Uh, and so I know you. the city has been in a lawsuit and has been dealing with the situation for quite some time now. I think the number I last heard was $75,000 in legal fees. Yes. But uh, the Supreme Court evidently has now come down and said, you're okay, you're right. How do you feel about all that? Well, I think uh, as, uh, as uh, the city council had passed an ordinance uh, several years ago that did not permit the establishment of medical marijuana uh, dispensaries uh, in the city of Auburn. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the group that started the business uh, applied for a business license to open a flower shop. And uh, then it devolved into, and, and I guess their original intent was to use this as a test case, I guess. But uh, in any event, uh, uh, when, and it was right near the Boys and Girls Club, which uh, across the street from the Boys and Girls Club. So uh, we, uh, we shut them down because they had fraudulently put in their, in their business license, they were doing things that had not been approved. So <clears throat> that went, resulted in a court case brought by the proprietors of this business and uh, ultimately worked its way through the courts to the uh, California Supreme Court. And I must say, uh, it, it, it stood for the right of local governments to make decisions whether to have them or not to have them. Uh, but it, it wasn't just the, the Auburn, California case that they were addressing. There were other issues as well. So uh, I think uh, uh, we did well in that. And uh, uh, you know, we may at some point want to readdress the whole issue of uh, medical marijuana dispensaries uh, uh, in the future, but uh, I don't see that happening at this time. Mike, there were 200 other communities within the state of California who will benefit from this settlement. Uh, will they be able, or were they part of the lawsuit, and we, does Auburn get a chance to recover any of that money? Well, uh, <laughs> the, the recovery of any of our legal fees is probably a moot point because the person who uh, we were in, in the lawsuit with has basically gone broke and there's no, we, we don't feel that we need to spend more money to go after it to get nothing. So uh, we'll probably uh, just leave it at that and, uh, and not uh, proceed any further. I'm Barry Steigers with News Channel 20. People in North Placer came out in large numbers this week and attended the supervisors meeting at the domes. They were mad. They've been unhappy for a long time about the treatment of their sewage water. The decision was made some 18 months ago by the Placer County supervisors that they would join in on a regional pipeline that would feed the wastewater from North Auburn all the way to Lincoln. Lincoln, some time ago, when Sun City was built, received a new water treatment plant and it was sized to not only handle all of the new residences coming in because of Sun City, but also for a long-term growth. It was large enough that with some expansion, it could become a regional treatment plant. What we learned is that the State of California and the Water Resources Board have been pushing for regionalization of wastewater treatment. As many of you remember, we've featured here on this channel how the city of Auburn feels about it, 
they don't want to join in with this pipeline. But the county already did. So this past Tuesday at the Domes, they had a hearing. The hearing was for a rate increase of almost $20 per user per month. This money is to go to pay for that pipeline. So there were a lot of mad people there, and the News 20 cameras were there. These are the actions that we're asking your board to take this morning. The first three will set the fee at $95.78, and that will provide the state revolving fund with the assurances they need to complete our funding. Um, as I mentioned, it'll also let us move forward with uh, the billing. The last action that we're asking you to do, um, your board could choose to reduce the fee that's charged to the customer by applying outside funding to the project. Absent that direction, we're asking you to uh, for direction to assess the full fee of $95.78. And at this point, I would turn it back to you for the public hearing. Ready. I'll now open the public hearing. To the board, I'm Jack Sanchez. I live in North Auburn. Oh my <clears throat> and I don't think that any vote that you take is a permanent vote. You can recall your vote anytime you want. It hurts fishes in Coon Creek because of the streams that lead up to Coon Creek and ultimately, what I'm most concerned with, it will hurt fishes in the Auburn Ravine. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. My name's Dan Sable. Uh, I've been a property owner in this district for the past 22, 23 years. I have a rental property that I developed down on Edgewood Road. And I have uh, three parcels on approximately one acre with seven connections. My current rate fee is around almost $6,000 a year. The increase will bring that to another $1,300 a year approximately for my tenants, which are mostly elderly and you know all the problems with the problems us old people have with uh, keeping up with the times and the dollars and all that. Um, I've not raised any of my rents for the past four years just because of the economic situation we're all facing. When I received the notice of this meeting and the possibility of doing a protest to the fees. The part that scared me of the fact that there's no guarantee on what our fees are going to be. The fees are open-ended someplace and, you know, based on the past, this Board of Supervisors has approved by what I read in the newspaper, everything that from this sewer district that's come before them in this time frame of the last 20 years. Uh, it may be time to look at options. So all of, our, all of our fees would go up, and then of course the interesting question is, once you get all this money and you build up all this infrastructure, will our rates go down? <laughs> no. To me, to me, that's a fair question. If you yeah. need the money, if you need the money to develop the system, then when you get the system developed, we should no longer be paying thousand dollars a year, which is what I'm paying now. It's a negative impact, and the property owner pays nothing. The homeowners pay it. I turned in 123 protest forms to you, Jim, last week. Mm -hmm. I turned in 18 more this morning. So that's 60% of the homeowners of our park protesting. Supervisor Montgomery, you represent North Auburn. We would appreciate it if you would support your constituents and deny this tax increase because many of them are senior citizens. And <laughs> every, we, we don't have any discretionary effort on this tax we have to pay it and if the Social Security increase goes through which is chain CPI that means nothing we get nothing so we don't have an annual COLA we can rely on and if you increase this tax on us it's really going to be negative for us so I appreciate you denying the tax increase thank you uh, just to be clear uh, so the property owner gets billed for the sewer tax, but he bills you in your rental 
a statement. Yes. So it's every, we have a base rent and then the sewer is added yeah, into that. Yeah, that's extra. And if this is approved, that's going to go up. That's right. Okay. Over $9 a month. Thank you. Thank you. And also, to be clear, um, this is a fee. It's not a tax. It shows up on your property tax. Okay. Right. okay. You, you, you may, you may I'm sorry. You all, you all consider it a fee. Okay. Well, you, you but for the people who pay it, it's a me tax. And I encourage. Okay. I want to. As I see it, we're looking at. Uh, about a fifteen to twenty thousand dollar lien against my property, basically, to pay for this project over the next thirty years, and I think if I had a lien on my property, I really should have had some say on that lien being imposed, because that's basically what it is. Uh, that's figuring, you know, five thousand connections and seventy million bucks for this thing, and you know, as I read through this material, this rate increase that's proposed here, or however, is to cover cost and initial operations, final rate to be determined. That scares the hell out of me. Of restricted means, but not limited means, and I feel terribly sorry for these people that are of, on very uh, limited means as to what this is gonna do to them, because uh, it's gonna be a choice between whether you flush the toilet or go buy a bag of dog food to eat. So with that, I'd urge you to not impose this, and let's go back, as it says in here, and look at something that we can afford that's really within our means. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Renna Webb, Morning. and I live on Lilac Lane. We have lived there 46 years, and we have paid this rate increase every year since it started. And I do believe you deal with millions of dollars every day. And a thousand dollars doesn't mean much to you, but it is a burden to me and others that are on Lilac Lane. Many of us have lived there the 46 years and some more, and we uh, have, have not increased our income like that because, as you see, uh, I have increased my age I don't say I'm elderly, but I'm 96 years old. And many of us have paid this fee. We've not said a word before, but I do say it now because $1,000 has put a burden on many of us in, in our area. And we did pay a sewer fee and clean up a lilac lane when we moved there. We had a dirt road and we were on septic tanks and then they put the pipes in and we took 20 years to pay that off. And now we've started paying off more with the less income and I do oppose this rate. Thank you, Mrs. Webb. My name's Dennis Kennedy. Uh, I'm mad as hell, you know. It's kind of crazy that I don't see any options that when I went to the meeting Thursday were presented there on refurbishing the plant in Jurga Road, period. It's, it's, we're going with the pipeline. Uh, it's like we're too late. It's sorry, it's all over, we gotta pay this or else. I don't see that we have an option. And my 93 year old great uncle, you know, he's a, uh, he doesn't have the income to spend for all this. But to rebuild the plant, what happened to that option? It's not on the table anymore? Uh, sir, wh where have you been the last two years? I was born and raised here. You're not even in this district. <laughs> and I don't appreciate you being rude to right, the stop. people. That all right. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Kennedy, if I might address your concern, because I've heard that from a number of people, so I, I do want to make very clear why we're looking at a rate increase today rather than a, a decision on a project. Um, the decision on the project was made by this board 14 months ago after about 12 years of discussion leading, leading up to that decision. Um, I think we all sat through some fairly lengthy public meetings. I did hear the question, were they public? They absolutely were. They were very well noticed in the Auburn Journal. Uh, the Auburn Journal covered it um, extensively. Uh, we had hundreds of people 
in attendance at those meetings um, from all over the county, but predominantly from SMD1. Um, and so the, the reason to answer your question just very directly that we're not talking about a different project today is because this board made that decision 14 months ago. Thank you. Yeah, it's, you know, this has been an extraordinarily unusual issue in 19 years that I've been on the Board of Supervisors. I've frankly never seen anything like this, and I'm, I'm disappointed and saddened, actually, by the way uh, this process has emerged. Um, so I know there's a lot of public comment yet to be made, uh, but I want to put some things out on the table now so hopefully uh, we can improve the health of, of the process. Um, as has been mentioned, this issue has been discussed by the Board of Supervisors for 12, 15, maybe 19 years, depending on who's counting and, and how they're counting. And there continue to be an unprecedented number of uh, comments that are blatant miscommunications of history and fact, and we continue to see that over and over again. So the discussion today is to talk about the rate increase. The decision as to whether or not uh, what option we choose as to requiring to upgrade our SMD1 facility has already been made. It's been made 14 months ago. It was a two-year process that was very public that led to that, and even more than that. There was plenty of opportunity to to present in front of the board and or lobby us individually as to your preferences as to what option uh, we chose. None of the options that we had available to us would have avoided uh, or, or allowed us to, to not involve about $70 million in new debt. Uh, and so it's important to keep in mind as we've considered these alternatives, what we know is the history for sure. What we're less certain of is the future, but the history shows unequivocally uh, that the rates in 1990 for, for all ratepayers in Placer County were about uh, $10 per month per, per household. Uh, so in the cities where they have large user bases, all of those rates are about $30 today. In the foothills, all of those rates today uh, range from uh, 60 to $111. Uh, they're much higher. Most of those cost increases have been, almost all of those cost increases have been the result of new regulation, new federal and state regulation for which we don't have the choice to comply. So the question only is to this Board of Supervisors, what is the best way to comply with future regulatory requirements and what's the most cost effective a way to comply with new regulatory requirements, not only for today's ratepayers, but for the ratepayers 20 and 30 and 40 years down the road, because you can believe that new regulation is not going to occur. I think that's absurd. If you do believe new rate uh, regulation is going to occur and drive up those rates, then the best question to be asked is what's the best and most cost effective way to comply with those new cost increases? And this board has decided to build a pipeline to Lincoln to the facility that has the highest performance of any facility in South Placer in terms of rate compliance. Its rates are comparable uh, to those of Rockland and Roseville. And that decision has been made. I, I'm amazed when I hear Jack Sanchez talk about dewatering when he knows on a daily basis there are ongoing discussions about buying makeup water in any and all of the systems. I'm amazed with anybody who says that they care about fisheries talking about it being a good idea to have treated wastewater in a fishery environment, particularly the most sensitive part of that habitat. We're all sensitive to the rate increases that, that you all will have to bear. We're not insensitive to that at all. It's simply been a function of trying to compare alternatives in the scheme of state and federal regulation. And, and sadly, uh, there continues to be a huge amount of miscommunication and misrepresentation of the facts. And that's the part that we need to get past. Uh, so, so I apologize for the speech um, uh, at this point in time, uh, but I hope that we can improve the public hearing. As well. Wayne Nader, uh, North Auburn resident. Um, I have three properties in uh, that are serviced by this uh, facility, so I'm certainly impacted by the decision. I'm gonna kind of modify some of the comments that I was going to make based on kind of where obviously you're trying to go with this. Uh, rather than trying to justify where you are, uh, 
I do I, uh, appreciate the pain that you've gone through. I've experienced it with you because I've attended the hearings on this subject. And I think that it really comes down to you made a decision obviously based on what you felt was in the best interest of the people that are in this district. And I know it's a painful one. I know it's an emotional one to the residents here. I, in listening to the discussions, I understand the reasons for making this type of decision. These are things that are forced upon us, as you've already stated. We don't have a choice. If I was to answer uh, Chairman Holmes' question, what is the benefit to these people today? There's very limited benefit probably in the next five years, but the real benefit will be down the road 10, 20, 30 years from now. And those residents at that time will look back at this decision as a very wise and prudent decision. We see where the rates are going. We know that is not going to change. The bureaucrats and the politicians in Sacramento will continue to crank out mandates, maybe I should say spew out mandates to us, that we have no choice but to have to comply with. Those have substantial financial implications. So the decision that you made many months ago was a wise decision. I know it was very difficult and controversial amongst you as a board, but you've made that decision. I applaud you for that decision, and it is continuing to be the right direction for that. I, again, I am sympathetic to the people who are being impacted, especially the seniors, which is a substantial population, as you know, in the North Auburn region that are serviced by this. I wish that there was some way that we could address uh, those uh, who are severely impacted financially, if we could uh, somehow uh, buffer them against this impact, but I don't know that there's a reasonable way to do that. But again, I would encourage you to move forward on this fee increase. Uh, so let me ask uh, the board, what is uh, the benefit that these people receive? Can, you, can Robert, can you tell me that, Supervisor Rank? Can you tell me what benefit that these people, the, the retired people in North Auburn, the low-income people in North Auburn, what is the benefit that they're going to receive out of building a pipeline to Lincoln? Supervisor, I'm extremely disappointed with that question because that's a question that we have been I'm over with. I'm extremely disappointed that three supervisors are telling me what my ratepayers need, the people that I represent, the people that I've grown up with and I've gone to school with, I've gone to their funerals, I've worked on their cars. You're telling me what my ratepayers have to pay the people that I worked with for over 60 years. I, I've been on the downside of, of votes many times. The difference between you and I is that I move on, all right? I say what I have to say. The board, the, the board has made a decision, and if you don't like that decision, that's, I understand that. But Mr. Chair, you asked, if uh, electeds uh, back in the early 60s made a decision to build a pipeline from North Auburn down to Lincoln to have their wastewater treated. Today, rates up here would be much cheaper than they are today. And so we're confronted with repeating history, which will likely provide, almost certainly provide, much higher rates to people 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Or uh, we can do something different and something innovative and protect rate people ratepayers today as best as we can, uh, but also find better solutions for people in the future. Not only it is, is it likely a tremendous insurance policy for ratepayers in the future, but it's much better for the environment. And as custodians of our natural resources, uh, that is an equal obligation. And the fact of the matter is, because of state and federal regulation, we don't have any choice but to comply. It's only a function of how much it's going to cost or what strategy by which we're going to do that. Well, coming here to talk with it looks like it's a non-use thing. You guys have already made up your mind. Now, I'd like to know what is going to be the final cost. Have you got engineered plans and totals yet? No. no. What? what is going to be the final cost? We don't know. Clearly, really all I want is for you to really think about that rate increase. Uh, 
the 73 million a month ago was now 76 million. The interest rate was 1.7, now it's 1.9. Uh, all of those things that are unknown is gonna affect that rate hike. I heard yesterday in the meeting that it could go up yearly. Uh, and how much yearly? I'm here in support of my mother who has over half of her property tax bill now goes to paying for sewer. I think most of us would like to get a little more solid information. I understand we're talking about fees. I do believe that the board can table today the decision to make a decision on whether or not there should be a fee increase. Is that correct? I think so. So I have one other question. 14 okay. months ago, when you were giving information to the public, did you discuss the fee increases? And the letter that came out March 21st to today, do you feel that that is enough time for people to, I mean, do you feel you gave people enough time to really voice their opinions? So I'm in an agreement with that there wasn't enough time for people to really understand in North Auburn what was coming down the pipe. Are any of the 13 members that made up the initial commission going to benefit from this in any way? There were 13 members that initially came together. Uh, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't know what that is. On the sure. recommendation committee? I have it on, I've got to have it on my Kindle, but I don't have an internet. Oh, it was a connection. technical advisory committee, was that? So there were 13 members initially huh. to make recommendations. It could be in reference to the Placer Nevada Wastewater Authority, oh, and I yes, don't recall were, exactly how many so members. So there are engineers, were architects. Oh, yeah. Are any of those in a position to benefit from this? I'd like that to be under consideration. Yeah, I can. Um, can't speak to that. And I'm just unclear. I'm sorry it doesn't address just specifically the fee increase issue. But will the plant be owned by Placer County or the City of Lincoln? Excuse me, the treatment plant is owned by the city of Lincoln and okay. that will remain that way. And a long-term consideration that I haven't heard brought up is we all know a water shortage is coming. Who will have control over that water? Has anybody addressed that issue? Are you referring to the reclaimed water that will be produced at the... In the next plant? 10 years, water is going to be a global, could be potentially a global issue. There are already corporations buying up property on streams, sucking the water out of our lakes. And will we have the control, will North Auburn and all of Placer County have the control over the city of Lincoln if for some reason there's a water shortage? Have you given that consideration? I'm against the fee, and I took it upon myself on Saturday to spend a couple hours in a local neighborhood. I knocked on 40 doors. I got 20 answers, 15 signatures. But of those 20 people I talked to, the one thing that was really impressed me, or not impressed me really, was there was a humongous lack of knowledge about the pipeline, local sewer, the fee, in future situations like this. We need to figure out a way to get more of that information out to the public because there's just not that much out there. I've lived in Auburn 30 years. I'm sorry I was not involved in this process earlier, but I don't take the Auburn Journal. Um, I, I know I should have paid more attention and uh, I will in the future, I promise you that. Um, in the past several, even up to 10 years, the board has showed a lot of um, long-term cost investment and capital improvements that are gonna benefit the people of the county. I am opposed to the fee, but if I have to pay the fee, I would like to see the money spent on a project here in the county, an asset that we will own after. Uh, I'm Robert Snyder, uh, live in Auburn. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about this. Um, I'm probably one of the few individuals in the room that has sat through the 12-year process. And I'm also um, a civil engineer, landowner, and uh, paid a close attention to the pluses and minuses. Um, to answer the question, mostly for the audience, of why we're here, uh, it's the Clean Water Act. We elected representatives at the state and federal level who passed a law that said, um, over time, we will clean up our water sources. And that's what we've been doing 
forever, and we will continue to do unless you change those elected officials, and I don't support that. I think the Clean Water Act has been beneficial to the United States, and uh, we, this is just one of the things we have to live with. I'm going to give you an example of uh, another way to think about this, because this is, it needs to be simplified in some way to understand it, because it is very complicated, and it would take a day for you to really understand all the pluses and minuses of all of the various uh, alternatives. But let's say you need a pump to operate and exist. You must operate that pump. You must maintain it. And there's a cost to operate and maintain it. Over time, you learn that the pump must be replaced every five years. Plus, there's additional water that has to be pumped. So it's not only the same water, you have to, it's increased every five years. You want, want to find a choice that's going to provide you the lowest cost over time to operate that pump. And that's what the board has done. If you look at the chart up here, you'll see a couple of interesting discrepancies. One of them is the treatment plan operations. There's a four plus dollar uh, difference between what Lincoln pays and what we pay. That's because they have a larger rate base, they have a modern plant, and it's expandable. It's easy to uh, accommodate any changes. One thing you haven't heard today is that the plant that we have here that you want to hang on to and maintain has the capacity for a one half a day storage in case something goes wrong, if something breaks. They have one half a day to fix it, otherwise they're paying fines. In Lincoln, they have the capacity for 60 days. That's a huge difference. If something goes wrong in Lincoln, they can shut the plant down and take 60 days to fix it. How can anything go wrong? You don't have the room or the capacity to ever do anything like that here. <clears throat> So you find a pump that will last a long time. This pipeline will last 70 years. Another component of this chart is the regional project debt service payment. It's financed over 30 years. That component goes away in 30 years. It will be paid for, yet you'll be able to continue to use it. My last comment is for the low income people in t here. If you are actually considering putting some money into this project, you need to direct it not to every rate payer, because most of them can afford this increase, but some can't. You need to find a system where you have a qualifi qualification, single person in a household or two people in a household. Instead of paying for a whole family, they should be paying for what they actually use. So I would suggest that you find a way to have a system where those people can qualify and have a lower rate, and it would be paid by the general uh, fund and not by the rate payers fund. Thank you for the time. I truly wish some of the passion that's here in this room today had been here 14 months ago. We might be discussing a different alternative, maybe, maybe not, but this is where we are today. Agendized for us today is discussion about a rate increase, not a project alternative. We can't reset the table that way. The submitted protests constitute less than 3,930 threshold for a majority protest. The clerk of the board therefore determines that a majority protest does not exist as to the SMD maintenance and opposition fee. Okay, thank you. So the protest, protest vote has, not, has failed. The final decision by the supervisors, the rate increase goes through. Barry, with the camera about town today, ran into Councilman Mike Holmes. He was at the Ridge, and we had a chat about Mike's recent trip to China. Here's what he told me. It was quite an event. One of the <clears throat> exciting things is that uh, I renewed, uh, for me anyway, was I renewed some uh, friendships with a couple of people that I knew uh, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, in China, and uh, it looks like uh, we may have some opportunity for some Chinese investment in the Auburn area. Uh, they're interested in uh, uh, coming to the United States and maybe investing in some property and that sort of thing. And uh, also, uh, part of my task was to encourage uh, uh, the Chinese travel market to include Auburn 
in their planning for groups from China coming to the U.S. rather than just going to San Francisco and Los Angeles and San Diego, but to come to a small town like Auburn and see the other side of what life is like here rather than uh, just a large city. So uh, that, uh, that effort is uh, ongoing and uh, it looks like uh, uh, possibly in June we'll have a small group from uh, China come to Auburn to take a look at uh, what we have to offer. Mike, one of my impressions has been, uh, based on television and other things that I read, that uh, we live here in California and uh, pollution and air quality is extremely important to us and we tend to be somewhat of a leader in that area. Uh, but I didn't feel that was true in China. You've been there. Tell me, what's the difference between their air pollution factor than here? Well, a lot of their air pollution is caused by uh, the fact that they burn a lot of coal and uh, they don't have the hydroelectric uh, uh, system as we do here. And of course, you're talking about 3.2 billion people. Uh, and uh, yes, it is a problem. And uh, I, I must say that uh, they are trying to do something to clean up the, uh, the, the bad air. And as you may know, uh, some of that, uh, we get some of the, the air from China that is picked up in the jet stream and it comes to, uh, to California. So, uh, but they're conscious of that. They're trying to do something about it. As a matter of fact, in Shanghai, they've got a fleet of taxis now that uh, use uh, natural gas to get around and they're clearly identified as a, a different source of uh, uh, propulsion and uh, so that they're aware of this and they're, they're trying to address it. Each week we talk about the homeless. We also talk about the mentally ill and how and what it affects in Placer County. This week we took the camera and went to visit with the superintendent of schools in Placer County. And here's what she told me about both of these subjects and how it affects the school systems in Placer County. With the homeless first, it has, uh, it, it's a no borders community. Does it affect our school systems in Placer County? It absolutely affects our uh, systems of education in Placer County. We have about 70,000 students that we educate uh, throughout the county in grades uh, kindergarten through 12th grade. And of that 70,000 kids, we estimate that there is um, about 1,700 to 1,800 children that meet the federal de definition of homelessness. So with that comes services and needs that our schools have to be able to provide in order to meet some of the basic criteria as far as making sure that they have food, making sure that they have shelter, um, and those needs come first and then come the educational needs. So we need to focus on the lower level needs before we can uh, focus on the educational needs. So we do have um, a system in place to address that here in Placer County. I was under the impression that the homeless community has no borders and therefore it's moving on a constant uh, basis. Does this affect the school system? In other words, does a child show up at school A on Monday and maybe school B by Friday? Yeah, that happens a lot. Mobility is a big issue, uh, not only with homeless students, but with foster students as well, as they sometimes um, are being placed in different homes and different families, different communities, and then have to attend different school districts. And so, yes, the mobility of students um, because of causes uh, unrelated to their uh, achievement, but more towards uh, causes related to their home life, uh, or the instability of their home life does create a high mobility rate and it makes it very, very difficult to educate these students on a consistent basis. Now I've had some experience with children where you move into a new community and you have to go to the office and you have to fill out paperwork, endless paperwork sometimes, and then the child shows up and is already programmed into a system. How do you deal with the fact then 
do they do this? In other words, are, are they going through the same process that I would go through to get to school, or do they just literally get dumped off on the front lawn and walk through the front door? Um, each school district has a homeless liaison, uh, a staff member that's identified for doing outreach in their community in order to identify the number of students that could potentially be homeless that are not currently educated. Um, and then at the county level, we do have a homeless liaison that works in coordination with all of the 16 school district homeless liaisons. So we try to put together some sort of a coordinated uh, effort countywide where we are doing outreach to areas, whether it's uh, motels, uh, shelters, uh, campgrounds, uh, laundromats, that sort of thing, where we do have um, school personnel going out trying to find kids, trying to make sure that they're enrolled with school. Um, and with these kids, there is an expedited um, enrollment process where we do enroll them. And so within the next day, um, they are hopefully at that point attending school. But, but we do have a, pro a process by which we go out and we actively look for children. Gail, who pays for all this? Well, uh, we actually, many of our school districts get federal funds through the McKinney-Vento uh, Act, which provides uh, funds for school districts to provide technical resources, uh, technical assistance to these families, and to provide support services. Uh, we receive a couple of state and federal grants that are uh, at the County Office of Education that are directed towards uh, outreach and direct service and technical assistance for our school districts. Um, so that a lot of it, most of our money comes from the state and federal government. Let's switch gears. One of the projects I'm working on is how the federal and state and county deals with the mentally impaired. I have to believe that this would affect the school systems. Does it? Very much so. Um, the um we have a federal piece of legislation called IDEA, which is Individuals with Disability Education Act. And students who come to school with some sort of a emotional uh, issue that causes emotional instability or emotional outbursts, um, um, we have uh, many students in the county who suffer from that. And it's up to the school districts uh, to identify those students and put together an individual education program for those kids that meet not only their academic needs but their emotional needs um, as well. We've been doing a lot of work with uh, early intervention, identifying poti uh, potential students that have maybe potential issues that are not full-blown um, um, where they're going to need deep end services and so we put a, a large amount of effort and resources into behavioral therapy at our school districts working with students and families so that we can catch students early, provide them the necessary mental health needs, and therefore hopefully keeping them out of the, the, the greater, more costly, the more expensive programs where students end up maybe in a residential program um, because of the severity of the emotional disturbance that they may particularly have. So this is something that we've been providing a, a great deal amount of effort. And we actually have schools, the county office actually runs schools specifically designed for students with severe uh, special education needs, uh, severe special education emotional needs. Two other questions, Gail. <clears throat> on, a, on a scale of one to ten, how many of the students fall into this category? Oh, actually, I don't have that number for you. We have, um, I would probably, I would say there's probably hundreds of students in the county. Out of 70,000 students, we probably have hundreds, if not maybe a thousand of uh, students who qualify uh, under IDEA, Individuals Disability Education Act, for severe emotional disturbance. Um, many of them, uh, we serve approximately 40 to 60 students. Uh, kindergarten through grade 12 uh, in our program, which are the most more severe program, but many of our school districts do serve the less severe on their school campuses. But I would say upwards of, of more than a thousand students in the county. Final question. Over the last 10 years, have you seen this area grow? Is it bigger than it was? Yes, in the last 10 years we have seen uh, a growth in the need for uh, mental health services for our students. However, what we are seeing in the last couple of years is we've put a great deal amount of resources in early intervention and early care and the number of severe students that we have has greatly reduced. For example, 10 years ago we had probably a uh, a need for 150 students uh, in a, a PCOE program for severe mental, uh, for, for severe uh, mental uh, disturbance. Uh, right now we're between uh, 40 and 60, so we've seen a decrease uh, in the severity, 
but more of an increase in the lower level um, um, emotional disturbance. And, and we think that that is because we've been putting a great deal of emphasis on early intervention and catching the students early so that we don't allow these problems to prolong, be untreated, and therefore result in some, some deep end uh, emotional disturbance issues. Our own Paula Johnson is out and about again with her neighborhood beat, and here's her report this week. Hi, I'm Paula Johnston with Auburn News 20. What's your name? My name's Fred. And Fred, are you a volunteer here? I'm a volunteer. And what's your name? I'm Catherine. I'm a Catherine. volunteer too. And you're also a volunteer, and you've done this before, I assume. I've been doing it for about 12 years. 12 years? Right yeah. after I retired. And tell me something about the Plaza High School students. Uh, they all come. It's a badge of honor. Plaza yeah, the, the, there is a reason. It's a biology teacher, Thomas Schroeder. <laughs> Ah, it's his fault. <laughs> yeah, he, he's one you should also talk to. Tom Schroeder, too humble to speak on camera, said the kids and the volunteers are the most important thing and that they all do it because it's a good thing to do. And what's your name? I'm Nicole Kettlecamp. And what are you doing here? Uh, today I am signing everybody in and out and I hand out the t-shirts and make sure they know where to go. That's very nice. And have you done this before? No, this is my first time. And have you donated any blood? I'm not. I'm only 15. Oh, so I can't. so you're not old enough yeah. yet. Do you plan to? Definitely, without a doubt. Oh, that's really wonderful. And I've heard such a lot of good things about Plaza High students. I hear it's a rite of passage almost or a badge of honor. Absolutely. Most of the kids, once they turn 16, they give blood when they go to Plaza. What a great bunch of students you all are. Thank you very much. Are you in charge here? Yes, I am. And what's your name, please? I'm Asia. So you're here at Plaza High School. Do you, have you been here before? Yes, I have. Is this usually a good turnout here? Uh, yes, this is a great school, awesome students. That's really nice to hear. What are the requirements for donating blood for students? Um, you have to be at least 16 years old with a signed parent consent form and weigh at least 110 pounds and be in pretty good health. That sounds good. And what are there any problems that ever arise from donating blood? Um, sometimes after donating, people can feel a little lightheaded or dizzy. It's really important that you eat and drink a lot before. Drink at least two to three bottles of water. Um, otherwise, you may not feel too good. But otherwise, as long as you follow the rules, then you should be fine. That's great. And they get some nice snacks afterwards, I see. Yes, they do. Our student volunteers make awesome um, homemade goodies for the donors. Oh, is that how it works? The students do that? The volunteers? They do. We provide um, packaged snacks and everything. We're not allowed to make snacks like that, but the students um, will um, bring in and make goodies and everything. And this is really awesome. This is one of the only schools that does that. Really? Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, hi, Latifa. I know you. Yeah, <laughs> So you you come over and volunteer at the TV studio, and here you are today. What are you doing today? I'm going to give my blood. Oh, that is really wonderful. And why are you doing that? Because I just want to give back to the community because I know a lot of people need it. So. Yeah. Do you know anybody personally that's in need? Uh, not really. So you're just doing this for, out of the goodness of your heart for the, yeah. for the community? Yeah. That's really nice. Are you nervous about it at all? Yes, because it will be my first time, so I'm kind of nervous. Oh, have you talked to the other students who've already done it? Mm -hmm. Yes, and they said, like, you'll be okay, so I just do it. <laughs> oh, well, that's very brave of you. It's, yeah. it's, quite, a, it's quite a brave thing to do, really, because you're giving away a whole pint of your blood. Yeah. <laughs> what do you anticipate? Do you think it will be painful or how do you think you're going to feel? I think I'm going to be okay because I'm not afraid of needles, so I think I'm going to be okay. I hope I'm going to be okay. I'm sure you will. Have you had a good breakfast mm -hmm. this morning? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Well, good luck. I hope it doesn't hurt yeah, and hope you that you're well. Much. Thank you for being here. Yeah. And so um, here is a copy of your um, receipt. Um, hotline number, their blood pressures, their post-donation instructions are on the back. This tells you about our rewards program. So, Cody, are you nervous? A little bit, yeah. Have you given blood before? No, I haven't. No? What do you expect? I expect that it will be fine and I get to save lives with this. So, 
That's great. Do you think it's going to hurt? A little bit. <laughs> but you're a brave soul. <laughs> As the phlebotomist takes Cody's blood pressure and finds a good vein, warning, don't look if you don't like seeing needles inserted. You are running great. So what's your name? Janelle Pickard. Did it hurt when they put the needle in? Not really, I don't really think about it. I'm not really scared of needles, so it's not really like a big deal to me. Did, have you done this before? Yeah, this will be my fourth time doing it. Fourth time? How old are you? I'm going to turn 18 in three weeks. I'm wow. Seven, I'm 17. That's really nice of you to do this. What what drives you to do it? Uh, just why not do it? I mean, I can, so I will. I mean, if it helps people. That's really nice. Is there a specific reason? Have you got anybody in mind that, you know, sometimes family members are having surgery or things like that and or have had surgery and, and that you're aware of the fact that there's a need for blood? Is there anything specific that brought you to do this? Not like direct family, but I have I know that it definitely helps people and I know that I can, so I'll do it. I mean, it doesn't hurt me at all. Good for you. And how do you feel afterwards usually since this is your fourth time? Um, a little dizzy usually, just need to sit down, feel really like relax, like I want to go to sleep, but I've never passed out or anything from it. Would you like to encourage friends or? Oh yeah, I mean, a lot of kids don't do it because they're scared of needles, so I mean, I guess that like a selfish reason I kind of feel like but I mean if you're not you should definitely come out and do it. Well thank you very much and thanks for your contribution to the world with your blood. <laughs> How are you feeling Cody? Really well. Does it hurt? Just a little bit just a little pinprick. Yeah that was when the needle went in how about now is it hurting now? No it just stings a little bit but I'm supposing that's natural. You expected that huh? Is there a specific reason that you're doing this? Have you ever had any personal um, family members or anything that have needed blood, or are, or are you just doing it for the general overall good of the community? Uh, my twin brother has needed blood sometimes because uh, he has had three open heart surgeries. Wow. And I have the same exact blood as him, so I'm hoping maybe one day my blood will somehow get into him. Oh, that's a really great, great reason to do that. Wonderful. So are you feeling um, lightheaded in any way or anything like that? No, not Did really. you have a good breakfast? Yes, I did. That's good. That's what I like to hear. All right, I'm going to let you uh, sit and bleed for a while, and I'll check in on you again after you're finished. It looks like you're about halfway. I'm looking at your bag of blood now. It looks like you're about halfway. Do you know how much they take? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a pint. Hi. Hi. What's your name? Yade Huntsbury. And why are you donating? To help out the people. That it. Is there alive. a specific reason? Do you know of anybody that needs it in your personal life, or do you, is it just for the good of the community? It's for the good of the community. I bet you're feeling really good about this right now. I feel, yeah, happy. Is this your first time, or have you done it before? I've done it before, like three times maybe. Yeah. Really? Wow. Aren't you great? And do you have anything to say to other people that might be afraid of doing this? It's not that hard. It's easy. Once the needle gets in. That's the hard part, huh? <laughs> Did it hurt? Not that much, just a little steam. Just a little steam? Yeah. And how's, it, how's the uh, area where the needle went now? How does it feel now? Oh, it's fine. No. It goes away quickly. Good. Well, we wish you good luck and hope you feel great and go have a nice snack and a nice long drink of something cool and you'll be back on your feet and on your way, huh? Yeah. yeah. So how are you feeling after you've donated blood? I feel good. I'm glad I did it, but I kind of feel, I felt a little queasy, but it's all good now, so... Yeah. So is this the first time? Yes. Oh, well, that mm -hmm. kind of explains it. Makes you feel a little lightheaded at mm -hmm. first, huh? Yeah, and I was really nervous, so I think it kind of made that work. Like, yes. it was worse because of that. Yeah, because I don't think you breathe properly when you're nervous, and so exactly. you get a little short on oxygen in the old brain. Yeah, <laughs> I was holding my breath when you put the needle in, so yeah, yeah. probably came from that. Yeah. So now that you've already done it, mm -hmm. would you do it again? For sure. Yeah. It's for a really good cause, so I'd be willing to do it again. Yeah. Do your family, does your family uh, donate blood? Um, my mom and my brother have donated before, but they have issues. They have really low iron, so I'm the only one in my family who's been able to su success successfully give blood. Oh, well, that must make yeah. you feel really good. Yeah, so I'm what's really your secret? How do you, how'd you keep the iron level high? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I just drank a bunch of water. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, good for you. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And thank you very much for talking oh, to yeah. us, and thanks for being here. No problem.
What are you ladies doing here? Well, I'm a volunteer with Sierra Donor Services, and we were asked to come, thanks to Wendy's son, who's a high school student here, to come and talk about organ donation. Um, whenever they get their driver's license, they now have to ask or answer the question, do you wish to become an organ and tissue donor? And they won't process that application until they answer that question. Uh -huh. So we're here to educate the students on that. So after they give their blood, we talk to them a little bit about signing up to be an organ donor. Do you, you say your son is involved with this? Yes, my son is a freshman here at Placer High School, and he let me know that Judy Johnston spoke in his health class about organ donation and her visit to the school inspired him he wanted to help out mm -hmm. and so that's why he's volunteering here for for Sierra donors and is he is he planning to be a donor he is planning on being a donor yes that's wonderful Wendy, uh, Wendy doesn't know this yet but her son signed up yesterday oh. <laughs> okay so how do you feel about that oh I feel great about that and do you do, do you have the dot on your driver's license I also? do have the pink dot on my driver's license oh. The reason I became interested in volunteering for Sierra Donor Services was that my son is a kidney recipient and at age eight he went into renal failure and um, received actually a living donation from his aunt and now he's 21 doing very, very well. So I've been able to see somebody go from being so very sick to being so incredibly healthy. I, I decided to become a volunteer to spread the word about how positive organ donation is. If somebody is not already a donor, how do they become a donor? Um, they have a couple of choices. They could go to our website at donatelifecalifornia.org and register there. It only takes about two minutes. It's completely confidential. Um, you can actually select what organs and tissues you'd like to donate, and you can also change your mind at any time. Oh, that's interesting. And the, and the other option is to wait until you get your driver's license, and the DMV will ask you at that time whether you wish to become an organ donor or not. Wow, that's fantastic. And do either of you know any reasons why people would not want to become one? What, what's your major, what do you hear from people about why they might not? And the biggest fear, I think, is that people think if they're an organ donor, they will not try to save their life, which is totally false, obviously. And I had heard that. I was wondering if one of you would say that, because I wasn't sure if that was a, yes. a widespread myth or if I had only yes. heard it. The emergency staff does everything they possibly can to save your life. And if you think of it realistically, they don't even know you're an organ donor at the time. What is it you guys are doing? Uh, we're checking people in and out. Mm -hmm. So this is where everybody comes after they've donated blood to get a treat? Yep, fill up. The best part? Yeah, definitely. I'll bet this is why they all do it, just for free cookies, huh? A lot of them. So who donates the, uh, the goodies? A lot of the workers um, make them and then bring them in. The, the blood uh, staff? Uh, a lot of the helpers. Oh, that the helpers? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So you all volunteer and do that? Yeah. That's wonderful. Cody Hitchcock, he's been on the sports scene again. Cody? Hello everyone, my name is Cody Hitchcock, I'm the Hillman flag runner, and I'm at the soccer match of Placer versus Lincoln. It's our last soccer game of the year, so it should be a good game. We hope to be at Lincoln, and we probably will. Tonight is seniors night here at the soccer game. So how does it feel to be PVL champion? It feels awesome, and um, especially being a freshman, it's like a really good feeling, definitely. Plasters won the soccer game today. Let's go Mighty Hillman. This has been Cody Hitchcock for Auburn News 20. Barry, it's all yours. I'm Barry Steigers. I'm your host here on Auburn News Channel 20 and on K High Morning News. See you next week.